it's chock full. It's exciting time. Fall is here, which is when we always kick off our programs. Our Bible college is getting ready to start here in just a few days. And if you look at those classes we are offering, I hope that you will take some of those classes if you're interested in that. The only correction we need to make instead of Monday night on teaching on the uh, this or discipleship and how to be leaders in the church, I'll be teaching that on Tuesday night. Because that way I can incorporate all my men who already come out and visit every Tuesday. And we'll just be doing it here Tuesday instead of Monday. Matthew will be teaching on the Holy Spirit, and that's what we've been preaching on. And lots of other neat things coming on. We've even looking at just, just reaching out more than we've ever done as community. We're getting ready to have our Restore the Power, which is our revival coming up. And of course this year we're going back to Lakewood Campground. And this year we're going to be eating. So you be planning on bringing lots of side dishes, as you know we haven't done in the last few years, but this year we're going to go back to feeding our bellies. Well, I tell you, you're an excited crowd today. I'm telling you, I can just feel it. I mean, it's just incredible. The energy's here. We're down a little bit, it looks like, this morning. Not a lot of people are here as normal, but that's okay. Uh, they probably got good excuses and probably all show up at 11 o'clock and that'll be wonderful. But... I hope that you'll be praying for that, that you will be able to reach a soul. What's your purpose in life? If it's not to reach somebody for the kingdom of God and bring them close to the Lord. And then like always, those who want to be baptized into the ocean, we have the largest baptistry in the world. It's called the Atlantic Ocean. And we'll be going there afterwards. And if you'll notice, the dates on this year are a little bit later. Instead of September, we're doing it in October. And I'm excited about that. Hopefully it'll be a little cooler and so on and so forth. So be praying about all that. All right, into our sermon. Matthew 14. Maybe you thought I was going to ask you to give money today. I don't know what it is, but we'll be all right whatever it is. <laughs> Usually our crowd's a little more lively at 8.30. Maybe you didn't get your second cup of coffee. Verse 22. Keep Brother Richard in your prayers. You know, I tell you, folks, life is so uncertain. I was talking to Pete last night, and I said, you know, we all ought to take a warning what's happening to Richard. That could be us any day. You could be before the Father to before I finish this sermon. And listen, folks, that's why you ought to be dedicating yourself to the Lord 100%. Because you and I know if you've read this Bible, and most of you probably have, he's not going to be impressed with the things of this earth. He's only going to care about what? His son. And what you've done for Jesus. We've got some visitors here. Be sure to make them feel welcome. I like this. This is cool. This is exciting. But I want to talk to you today about how we let fear stop us from doing greater things for the Lord. And I truly believe that. You know, I've been preaching 39 years altogether. And believe it or not, I used to be a person that was fearful. You'd say, oh, no, not you, preacher Danny. You've always been wide open. You've been going hard at it. But let me tell you, I've been in situations that I myself had to say, boy, you know, this could be a little scary. But you know, when I felt that way, I just said, well, if I'm doing this for you, Lord, and I'm trusting you, now if I wasn't doing something right, <laughs> I might have a reason to be alarmed. But if I'm following your footprints, you know, stepping where you stepped, then how can anything go wrong if I'm trusting you, even when the devil brings that emotion to you? You know, anytime you talk about giving more, serving more, working more, man, you know, the old devil says, well, I would, but how are we going to make this happen? And fear happens, and that's really what the Scripture is about today. So many people are like this in life. Matter of fact, uh, Barry Siegel wrote in his book, The World May End With a Splash, shares the following frightening statistics. Are you ready for it? I got good news for you. <laughs> if everyone keeps stacking National Geographics in garages and attics instead of throwing them away, the magazines will sink the continent at least 100 feet, according to estimates, sometime in the future. I want you to think about that. Can you imagine that? If you have ever eaten a pickle, anybody ever eat a pickle in here? I want you to listen to this. This is true. I'm not making this. <laughs> if you've ever eaten a pickle, I want you to listen to this. 
then, then you are a person in danger of having cancer. You are a person in danger of having many uh, uh, bad problems. It has now been known that pickle eating causes communism, airline tragedies, auto traffic accidents, and crime waves. How did they know that? Because they fed masses almost 20 pounds of pickle in one month and all these things they said apparently happened to them because people who eat pickles had auto accidents. People who eat pickle have car... I mean, you say, well, that's stupid, preacher. But this is how statistics scare people. They even said recently, for you who are on vacation here, God bless you for coming to the beach and God bless you for coming to church. But they have found out that if all the sand that sticks to your feet... <laughs> that if you keep bringing it off of the ocean's floor out there and off of, the, off of the, the shoreline, that the ocean and the floor line will sink over three feet if you keep taking our sand from us. <laughs> so what you ought to do is when you get off that beach, you ought to take your shoes and flap them real hard so we can get all that sand back on there. And I could read a thousand statistics just like that. What if you did this? You know what I mean? Have you ever noticed how science will come out and say, this is bad for you? Ten years later, that's good for you. <laughs> you know, and you said, wait a minute, you said eggs was bad. Now you're saying eggs are good. You know, it's almost insane. You don't know what to do. I hear these people sit there and say, you know, we're going to have to be more, be careful what we eat and do all that, folks. Guess what? They die too. I may, they may look better in that casket, but they die. I can tell you that much, you know. I remember years ago when I was huge into lifting weights and all that stuff, you'd see these guys and they'd, They'd be down here at the Gold's Gym, and they were always sculpting their body. And I, we even had Mr. South Carolina attend the church here for a while till he moved away. And, you know, all these wonderful things. Did you know he's dead now? If eating would have made him live longer, how come he ain't alive? Now, it wasn't because what he ate. He got killed in a car wreck. You see... If you're going to let fear stop you, then the devil's one. Plain and simple. Listen to the scripture this morning. John or Matthew 14, verse 22. Immediately Jesus made the disciples go in the boat, go ahead of him to the other side when he, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went upon the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land. Buffeted by waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were what? Afraid or terrified. Now, isn't that amazing? Jesus does a phenomenal feat here. He does what is impossible. He begins to walk on the water. To give you a quick little background history of how we get to this point, he has just fed 5,000 people with a few fish and a few loaves, hasn't he? And you know, that's a great example of giving too, isn't it? When Jesus said, who's got anything to eat? They found what? One little boy who had just enough food that his mama had packed him lunch. She was a good mama. <laughs> and she had brought it there so this little boy could eat. And Jesus said, bring it to me. Now, that little boy had to give up his lunch. Are you getting that? But look what he got back. You know, if you're going to gain in the kingdom of God, you have to be willing to sacrifice. And if you say, well, I disagree with that preacher, I'm going to say this. I don't think you're going to go to heaven. Does that shock you? Why would I say that? Because that's what Jesus taught us. And Jesus, where's Jesus right now? Well, if, if he's in heaven, <laughs> and I want a pattern of my life like him, what? I'm going to sacrifice, aren't I? I'm going to put people's needs ahead of my needs. I'm going to put the kingdom ahead of my needs. I have things I'd love to do and things I'd love to see, but I always say, what can I do to help the kingdom first? And if I live that way, I won't be selfish. Listen to me. I have said all my life in the 34 years preaching here, whenever I leave South Carolina, and you can guarantee I'm going to leave one day, but whenever I leave, I want South Carolina to say he was a giver, not a taker. It, 
I cringe when people just constantly are calling us, asking for something. I don't mind helping them, but you know what I've learned to say, just sort of facetiously, I say, oh, I'm so glad you called today. What are you going to do for us? And you'd be surprised. Oh, 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 oh. Well, wait a minute. We've helped you and helped you and helped you. I know you want to do something for the Lord. You can come over here and clean the carpet. You can come over here and take the trash out. Something you can do. We used to have a rule years ago one of our churches that we would never give out money to people and never do things like that. We, we said, you know, unless they were really physically down, we would just let them uh, come and work around the church and, of course, pay them because we didn't want to insult them. This is when I was in Charleston. And this is the truth. Of the dozens of people that came to that little church where I was at in Charleston, only one lady actually showed up the next day to work. She walked three miles to get there. And I was so impressed by her, her willing to do something that I gave her a $100 bill right there on the spot. And she said, well, I've come to work. I said, you don't have to. I said, really, it was just a test. And she said, I've come to do something for my Lord. And she worked day after day. Jesus expected to give. And he wants us to give. And this little boy shared. And look what happened. Jesus blessed it. And did the little boy go home hungry that night? So are, are we going to be people fearful saying, well, you know, if I have to give a little bit more, do a little bit more, I'm going to do without? You never do without, folks. That's the devil telling you that. That's the devil telling you that. Don't let Satan convince you of that. Even if your health starts to go, that doesn't mean that we should do less. I don't believe that. I believe with God's help we ought to try to keep up maybe with the pace or at least try to do something because why? If I'm going to be sick, I'd rather be sick with the Lord, wouldn't you? Because he promised he'd never leave me. He promised he'd never forsake me. He promised that. And I want to ask you a logical question. Will you think... Will you think with me? Shake your head. Say yes. I just know everybody's just, I mean, this is hard today. I don't know what's going on here. Most people are lively, but the rest of you are just sitting like, hey, listen, does not sinners suffer too? Shake your head. Is that right? Or doesn't sinners suffer too? Don't sinners get cancer? Don't sinners have heart attacks? Don't sinners have car wrecks? Don't sinners die? <laughs> you know? So don't say the Lord's picking on me. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's Satan attacking us. And we have got to realize it and say, and I like what Brother Richard said yesterday at the hospital. He said, you know, I must be doing something right. <laughs> and I said, amen, brother. Because if everybody speaks well of you, our master said, you may not be doing something right. Jesus didn't take, he gave. When this little boy willingly gave of his food, Jesus gave back a multitude. Can you see this little kid? You know, the Bible said he fed 5,000 people with those loaves and fishes. And when it was done, was there no more food left over? Did they eat till they just ran out? Listen to that. that. I want to point that out to you too. As long as they're in the presence of God, God will take care of you. The baskets will keep coming. It may not always be running over, but there'll be enough to make you get through this world. Amen? Amen? And listen to me. Can you see this little boy trying to drag all them baskets with him? He had 12 baskets behind him coming up to his mama. Now, you know half of that stuff spilled out, probably. <laughs> you know, but that'd be all right too because if it spilled out, that fed something else, didn't it? You know, God never takes from us. And I pray that this is not a congregation who's ever lived in fear. We are people who trust in the Lord, even through our times of ups and downs. And we're going to stick in here. And here's another story. Jesus is on the seashore. He lets these guys get out on the boat. You know what happens. There's a storm comes. Well, of course. Storms come. Comes to Christians. Sometimes you go through years of just calm water, don't you? I mean, seriously, you go through years of not having to even go to the doctor. I feel so good, I haven't had to go back in years. Sometimes you go through years of just financial, you know, just complete independence. Just every time you turn around, you say, well, ain't that something? I'm getting more and more blessed. I'm getting more than I ever, ever thought. Somebody else struggling here, but I'm just sort of, some, you know, 
treading, they're going through the water, just life smooth. But don't you ever think that the devil won't bring a storm. Because the same Satan loves to do that to, to cause to us to wake us up. And God allows it. God allows it. Because he wants you to have complete trust in him, not in things of this world. So they're on the boat. You know the story very quickly. As time's running out. And there's a great big storm and Jesus just comes right out there walking. Well, that's no big deal for Jesus. He made the water. By the way, he made your body. And he made the finances available. And he gave you the mind to have a job and a career. You know, the truth is, he's the one that deserves the credit. And these apostles wake up and they're scared to death in the storm. They're feared they're going to drown and they look out and when they see Jesus, they get scared. Now that's not unusual because in the time period of this time, the Jewish people had actually believed that they saw something like that happen and it was a, a bad omen. You know, like a, that's why they said, is it a ghost? You know, this is a sign that we are all doomed. You know, a lot of people, I don't understand this. I can sit in the world, but I can't sit in church. You know, I, I never read my horoscope. Did you ever read your horoscope? I never pay attention to that. I never read the fortune cookies. I like to eat them. But I never pay attention to them, you know. You know, and every now and then we go to a Chinese restaurant and some of the kids will want to start reading all these things, you know. I never paid attention to, to you know, uh, these omens or I never went to a psychic in my life. If you, I always say, I always said, if you want to really have fun out of a psychic, go to him and say, tell me my name. <laughs> you know, you know. I just, I don't fool with that stuff. Why? Because I know that's foolish. I don't base my life and everyday existence on what a human says. And I don't pretend or, or don't even pay attention to the foolish things that, that just seems like it's captivating people. I go to eat. I don't sit there and worry about somebody going to come in and shoot me. I understand that can happen. But if you let fear get a hold of you, you'll never go out to eat again. You'll never go see a movie again. You'll never go to church again. Because <laughs> somebody may come in here and kill you. You see what I'm saying? We cannot let the things of this world captivate us for just that moment. Listen. They just saw the moment. They saw the water. They saw the boat about to sink. And now they think they see a ghost. And they cry out. And of course Jesus says, don't worry, it's me. And Peter does what we know is a phenomenal thing. He is so excited. He's so caught up in the moment. He said, said Lord, can I come out there with you? And we can always criticize poor old Peter. He, he made his mistakes. I make my mistakes. Sometimes people criticize me, believe it or not. I make my mistakes too, you know. And if you're going to go again on your faith and your walk with the Lord, and if you think you're never going to mess up, well, then I'm here to disappoint you, but say you will. But we serve a God of grace, like the song we just sung. We're sinners, but we are saved by God's grace. Grace is spelled what? G-R-A-C-E. And that stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace is. You're going to make mistakes at times. But that don't, let, don't let that stop you from keep trying to do something for the Lord. Peter made a lot of mistakes, but you have to give the old boy some credit. He got out of the boat, didn't he? And he left the others sitting in the boat. <laughs> so many people are afraid to get out of the boat. So many people are afraid to make the challenge. Or they give what they have. Well, sure. You know, you've heard that little story that Jerry Clower tells sitting on the bench with Marcel led better when they were five years old. And Jerry says to Marcel, do you love me? They were first cousins. You all know who Jerry Clower is, don't you? I... <laughs> Times have changed. And Marcel said, why, of course I love you, Jerry. You're my cousin. And Jerry looked at him so innocently that as a five-year-old boy could say to another five-year-old boy, he said, he said, Marcel, if you had two million dollars, would you give me one? 
And he said he, Marcel, just threw his old arm around him and hugged him and said, of course I'd give you a million dollars. You're my cousin. We're blood. I'd gladly share to you. And Jerry said, I looked at him and said, well, give me one of your pigs. And said, Marcel said, now that ain't fair. I got two pigs. What's a tough crowd this morning. I'm telling you. Tough crowd. We're going to survive this somehow today. <laughs> we got visitors. They ain't going to come back if we don't be a little more lively here and do something. Here. They're going to think we're a dead bunch of people. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you know, it's easy to give away what you got. That's the point, isn't it? You see, that's the point. But Peter stepped out. Most people are so scared today to go on faith and trust the Lord. And that's a shame. Because as I have preached a trillion times, and we're proof of it, look what God has already done for you. Just put it plain and simple. Look how He has blessed you, protected you, loved you, saved you from going to hell. Why would we let fear get to us? Well, we're getting old. Well, so what? God was with you when you was young. Well, but I was able to work then. How did you know? These people born every year that's born crippled and sick and can't work, can't, ain't they? And God took care of you. Well, just because you're getting a little gray on top, that don't mean God's forsaken you. He will take care of His children as He promised. Peter walks on water. Listen to that. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Of all the things that Peter did wrong, I admire him for doing the one thing that really most people don't bring it out. But you know what? He did what no other human ever did since. He walked on water. And we know the rest of the story. As long as he looked at Jesus, he was fine, wasn't he? But all of a sudden, the devil, the devil brings doubt. You get the phone call. You get the bill <laughs> that you didn't expect. You, somebody comes in from the family mad at you. Your boss chews you out. You know, some tires up on the car. Tires up at home. All of a sudden, uh, here I was going to do something, but now what am I going to do? And you know, that was like Peter. He was walking as long as he looked at Jesus. He was fine. But when he took his eyes off the Lord, you see what that means? It wasn't just taking his eyes visually off Jesus. He let his mind wander, and reality hit him, and he said, I can't walk on water. This is insane. Yet he had walked. But he let his mind. You can think yourself into sickness. Am I telling it right? You can you can think yourself into to being a nobody. You can let the world beat you down so much, and they will do that because they love to stomp on your dreams. But you can finally sit there and say, I'm nothing, and I'll give up, and I'll quit. And when you do that, Satan has lifed you right into hell. Don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. Now the beautiful part of the story is, as it ends, you know how it ends. And check it out. He's not from a far off distance when he takes his eyes off the Lord. He is very close. How do I know that? Well, the rest of the scripture says, as he begins to sink and begins to drown, he cries out, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. And Jesus simply reaches out and grabs him by the hand. Now think of that. He wasn't like a mile away or a half a mile and then in trouble. He had gone that far. And that's another good illustration for us. Look how far God has taken you. Look how many years you have survived. Look at the times you could have been dead or in the hospital or broke or been in a terrible... And yet God brought you through those storms. Why now would you doubt... 
What's wrong? And when he starts to sink, the Lord, I don't know. Now, this is my thoughts on this. I think he's got a little sense of humor, maybe. Because he don't reach over and just grab him like you would a man standing right beside you or grab you by your shoulders. Where does he grab him? In this position. Watch. Reach your hands up, Dub. Which means he's letting him go down. <laughs> you know? He's letting him go almost under. Now, he didn't do it to be cruel. He wasn't doing it because he didn't care about Peter. He would die for Peter. But he's letting him He's letting him get what he asks. Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask for things just of this world. If that's all your realm of your spectrum of your faith is, then that's where it'll, he'll let you just do it. But as he starts to go under, Jesus grabs him and pulls him up and said, Why did you doubt? Oh, man of little faith. Why did you doubt? God has never forsaken us, even though we may think He has. God loves us. And I believe, as I get older, that the more faith I have in Him, it's just wonderful. I mean, what are you going to trust? Stock markets are plunging. Is that what you're trusting in your money? You trust it in our government? I'm not. I'm not, and it's not because of this administration. I just don't trust our government anymore. Are we going to trust in people? Well, that's okay for a while, but you know, people can let you down. Am I right? Your children can disappoint you. Your grandkids can break your heart. You say, well, I can't trust. Well, I'm going to trust in my spouse. Well, that's wonderful. If you've got a godly spouse and both of you love each other, but folks, listen. There ain't no future in that either. You don't ever know what they're going to do. People, people can change. If they fall in, they can fall out. I'm just being honest. Well, I'll trust in my job. Well, jobs end. Companies phase out. People sell out. And they'll walk you to the desk and make you take your keys walk you to the door and let you clean your little drawer out <laughs> and say thank you for your service. My father said when he left Fort Benning, Georgia after three years in Korea fighting for this country he said nobody was standing there cheering him. He said the man stood and saluted him because my father was lieutenant and he said thank you for your service to our country and then sit back down. He said, I walked outside in, in Fort Bend in Georgia in 1953 or two and sat there and looked around and said, hmm, ain't nobody here to pick me up. <laughs> and that's it. Why has that happened to us? Well, that's the nature of human beings. But you know, I serve a God who sticks with you even when nobody likes you when people disagree with you and he let his son die for your soul and I pray that this morning you don't let fear stop you from doing greater things for the Lord how will you do these things I don't know but God does but he asks you to step out of the boat have faith and keep your eyes on Jesus listen as we stand and sing